Well, I, it's, it's, it's actually, I find the Affordable Care Act fascinating because it's the most absolutely polarizing law that's been passed in, since 1965 uh, when the Medicare and Medicaid Act were, were passed. And that was the most radical law until 1964 when the Civil Rights Act was, was passed. But what I find so fascinating about the uh, Affordable Care Act is that everybody either loves it or they hate it, but tell me what's in it. Because it's really interesting, the, the strongly held views that people have without being able to say squat about what's in the bill. So anybody tell me what's in the bill. Effectively um, create, well, it, a lot of things. It's mostly health insurance reform, my understanding of it. Um, certain principles, like not being able to uh, deny individuals for pre-existing medical conditions uh, have been, that and other components are now instilled in the law such that insurance companies are obligated to provide service to certain people that before there were legal loopholes for them not to need to do that. Um, another big part of it is effectively a mandate that individuals are obligated to purchase health insurance um, lest they suffer some form of monetary tax penalty eventually as this is phased in. <clears throat> uh, I understand there's, there's a little bit of restructuring in terms of how physicians are compensated and how Medicaid works. The threshold for Medicaid has been increased so the more individuals can get on it. Um, those are the things that are coming to mind. I know there's a lot. So does everybody know all this stuff? Be familiar with, with all of this? Mm -hmm. So pre-existing conditions, what was, before the law, what was the deal about pre-existing conditions? Sure, companies have the right to choose. Yeah, insurance companies are private products. Uh, they are to some degree regulated uh, by federal law and by state law. So in New York State, uh, uh, for instance, I don't know if it's still a law, but it was a law about 10 years ago that every insurer in New York State had to guarantee coverage for 10 chiropractic visits. That was one of the things in the law. Didn't have anything to do with the chiropractor, chiropractor lobby. You know, it just sort of came out of the blue and this sort of thing. Um, so, so, pre, so if you, uh, and the problem, and you'll get this, you'll get hit with this as medical students. You better buy disability insurance now before, uh, so that you can have it when you're disabled. Um, um, people stay at jobs they don't want to stay at because now they are covered uh, because they have a pre-existing condition. If they move somewhere else, now they lose their coverage. Another part was uh, getting rid of caps. Uh, uh, of That once you hit a certain amount of money, then you were done. So one famous guy, everybody familiar with the guy named Christopher Reeves, who played Superman, and then he got a spinal cord injury? Uh, his insurance ran out. He hit a, his insurance had a million dollar cap, and after that he no longer had health insurance, and he uh, uh, spent basically all of his money before he died uh, on uh, health care costs. So that, that was an example uh, in the bill. And what's funny is everybody, many people hate the, uh, the, uh, the Obamacare, but you ask them, should you have coverage for pre-existing illness? Well, yes. Should you be able to continue your insurance? Yes. Should you have a cap on your insurance? Uh, uh, no, I, I want to be covered for, for whatever I need. So it's a weird, it's a weird bill. It's like the New Yorker just said, the way to get rid of Donald Trump is to have Obama come out and, and, uh, and pay for it. And then, uh, and then everyone will immediately uh, hate him. But what's your read on this in terms of good, bad, or indifferent? And why is there so much hatred toward it? So, 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 some issues that I've been reading about with it is that number one, the insurance plans that it has created through the marketplace are pretty insufficient and in some cases you get even worse access than with just Medicaid and so people are paying a lot of money for these premiums but they can't actually see any physicians so it's actually worse than being uninsured. Um, another issue is that healthcare premiums are still going up so like even though health insurance is now covering perhaps more things 
the premiums are still unaffordable for many people and it doesn't solve the cost problem. In, uh, so like I, when Obama like set out to make this bill, he said that he had two objectives and those were number one, to increase access, and then number two, to control costs since healthcare costs in America are way higher than they are in any other country. And so to, uh, to a large extent, he's achieved the first goal of control of expanding access, but I don't think he's really done much to control costs at all. So I think that's a problem and that still has to be dealt with. So is cost going up or gone down since the Accountable Care Act? Yeah, it's going up, but less than it's than it has in the previous 20, 25 years. Yeah, that's so true. It's, the, the it's like one, one or two percent. So this was one of the things that shocked me. You've heard about these insurance policies with a five or six thousand dollar deductible. So if you look at, at, at the graph of this, I was shocked by this. Because I'd never heard of this before, before Obama here. So if you start back to, uh, if this is 1980, and this is 2016, and Obamacare starts here, uh, the percentage of insurances uh, with $5,000 uh, deductible, I expected the curve to be like this. Well, and the curve actually looks like this. It's just a straight line. Just a, and, and Obamacare comes in here. There's not an upturn here in the in the percentage of high deductible insurances. So this was actually not a phenomenon of Obamacare. It was a, a phenomenon of insurance that already existed. It's just because the prices weren't posted, you weren't pushed to buy it. We could all be ignorant of it and just pretend like it didn't pretend like it didn't exist. So it's a weird, uh, it, it's, a, it's a weird thing. So, and, um, so what are the, now I remind you that, uh, I forget how much it spent, like two trillion or three trillion dollars on healthcare in the United States. Uh, when you talk about that amount of money, all that money goes to somebody, including all of us in the room. Uh, that's why the old saw that, uh, that uh, in medicine you start out a Democrat and you end up a Republican. Uh, uh, because you, you start out concerned about the world and you end up concerned about, I want my piece of the pie, I don't want you to mess with it, and uh, so leave me alone. And it's a, I mean, it's a genuine concern. I, think that I certainly think that we deserve the biggest slot of the pie and that everybody else should sacrifice except for us. I think that's a fair view, right? I, I agree with you that the law has been un demonized to a greater extent than it should be, and that too often people talk about repealing it as if that would solve all the problems where it would just take us back to where we were before. But I still think that some aspects of it are so problematic that they do need to go. For instance, I think like the cutoff for when an employer has to start providing uh, health care coverage and employees like 30 hours so what a lot of employers have been doing is they've just been forcing their workers to work less than that like um, uh, a friend of uh, my girlfriend's mom she worked at like the, one of the local libraries here and she really needed the work and she needed the money and then because of Obamacare they cut her hours down and now she's not able to work as many hours as she did and it adds financial stress on her life so I think that's just like one of the ways in which they, I don't know if they like. They probably didn't predict that, but that's one of the ways. Oh, you don't think they predicted that? I mean, I, I don't know if they predicted that. They, they probably knew that some employers would do it, but regardless of whether they predicted it, it's still a negative effect that I think. So, uh, one of the principles for all of these laws, uh, or for any <laughs> law, is that is that none of them can have a perfect aim. So, insofar as you have welfare. You allow for people to take advantage of that. Insofar as you have insurances, there are people that will be able to take advantage of that. So it's the question is always in what direction do you want to err? Because there is nothing that's consequence free. Uh, uh, so and so this is this would be certainly one of the this is an anticipated consequence what it would make that uh, uh, particularly small employers who didn't want to absorb the big nut 
of health care costs would shrink, would, would shrink their uh, employee hours so that they would not now be responsible for health care. The surprising thing, as far as I understand, is that that happened less than the predicted, not more than predicted. But uh, that certainly is going to be a consequence. Does everybody know about the death? Uh, spiral. Huh? Or which spiral? No, the, the death panel. No. Remember when this first came out? There was all this stuff about death panels. That wasn't true. Well, what, what, what you Republicans talked about it day and night. Fox News was all about death panels. <coughs> and everybody else was pretty quiet about it. I, it was shocked me as to why there was not a more aggressive response to this. But everybody know what death panels were? I mean, the, the, the claim was that there would be like a set of bureaucrats who would tell you how much you could spend on someone when they're nearing the end of their life and they're old and how much you could spend on their health care. But since that's not in the law. Yeah, I know it's not true. Where does it come from? Sir. Well, uh, I think uh, uh, other countries do do it that have socialized systems, no, and it's it's really it's, uh, it's, uh, they, they, they they do it in Britain. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to contain their costs. Um, and it's it's possible that, like you said, insurance companies could have a cap as well. Even if it's, there was no panel that did it directly, it would still happen indirectly when you have people uh, saying whether or not the certain treatment is necessary or so, going to reimburse for it. Here was the, what they called the death panel. Is up until this law, you have cancer. I want to sit down with you and have a long talk with you. We need to have a long talk about what the expectations are, uh, uh, what choices you want to make as, as we go along, if it works, if it doesn't work, uh, uh, if, if things uh, turn terrible and go south. Uh, how do you want to spend your last days? How aggressive do you want to be treated? This sort of thing. The problem with that is that that was not a reimbursable service. So doctors are churning patients through their office as fast as they can, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. So this law set aside saying that insurance companies must reimburse physicians for the time that they spend with the patient and their family laying out the course of care uh, for patients with terminal illnesses. This got translated into death panels. And uh, uh, what was bizarre about this was how the discussion just got completely, completely out of hand. Why do we have private insurance? Most other uh, countries, Western countries, have a some kind of universal insurance. They may have Cadillac uh, uh, things on top of that that, that uh, more well-to-do people can buy for extra services and whatnot. But uh, why do we why do we go in the direction of private insurance and employer-based insurance for competition? Mm -hmm. Generally based on increased competition, lowers price and increases. Actually, it was an anomaly of World War II. Really? Yeah, and the anomaly was as follows. There were wage freezes during World War II. And remember, this historically was a time when unions were very strong. And so unions, since they could not, because of wage freezes, uh, get you higher wages, they negotiated for other benefits. So one of the benefits they negotiated for was a health insurance benefit, because it didn't exist at the time. So for these large corporations, uh, this arose this whole industry of private insurance through the employer for the employee. And to a large degree, that took care of the problem. Yeah, they so left you with a lot of other problems. Elderly patients had no insurance. Uh, and a lot of elderly patients went broke uh, uh, from medical illnesses and died prematurely because they couldn't get adequate care. And that sort of led to Medicare, Medicaid. But so this was just sort of an accident of unions trying to get something when they couldn't get when they couldn't directly increase your uh, increase your wages. I I I mostly agree with that. I would say that so what happens is during World War II, uh, the government wants to control inflation, so it caps how much uh, companies are allowed to pay their workers. So companies still, you could either chalk it up to unions or if you, if you take a more market-based approach like I do, I would say that it was more because companies wanted to attract the best workers, 
So because they couldn't attract them by paying them more money, they attracted them by offering them fringe benefits, like health insurance. And then uh, over time, the government uh, gave special tax preferences to if your employer provided you insurance, it's tax deductible. So that's, so much, that's why it's so much cheaper to get insurance through your employer than it is if you just bought it individually on the market because of that tax preference. And I think that tax policy is the cause of a lot of the inefficiency in healthcare today. So, um, in terms of why we have a private health insurance system versus other countries that have uh, single payer, I would, America does have like a more free market and a more capitalist uh, tradition, whereas uh, most other Western countries have a history of very, very strong centralized governments that have, have a lot of authority. America did have a history of freer markets, which allowed it to become the most prosperous and powerful country in the world. So I would think that's why we have a more private insurance system. But I would also say that I don't think we, it's really fair to say that we have a private insurance system today, since more than half of every dollar that's spent in healthcare today is spent by the government, either through Medicare, through Medicaid, or a different government program. So less than half of every healthcare dollar that's spent is even spent by private insurance. Yeah, 64%, companies. I think, is the current number. Right, so, of, uh, so we, we have 64% single payer as it is. So it's a pretty simple. So what are the fundamental differences between single payer and what we have? Everybody has to be single payer. And that, what's that called? Because people mistake this. Is what, what's the difference between a single payer system and, and quote, socialized medicine? Do we have an example of socialized medicine in our country? Sure. The, the VA. Yeah, the VA system. It's government run. Government owned. Oh, somebody wants me. Yes, you got it. No, I just let me make a quick call. I can go for it. It's, just a, it's a free market call, so. <laughs> awesome. Um, well, while all he does that, uh, are there any other topics you guys specifically want to discuss? Yeah. Is there a real difference in quality between single uh, payer health care and market based health care like US and Europe? And how is Obama going to change that? Because people like to talk about how people have long been there, people also like to talk about oh, how. Somebody's trying to get in there. How everybody has to wait hey, for this each other. Here. How much of that is true and how much of that is true? I mean, yeah, it's, so it's, it's, it's hard to say what's just because okay. of single pair versus just because of civilized So anyway, we're here and I'm representing both sides. But I'm representing your side better than my side. Uh, yeah, so we initially had Do yes. Dr. Uh, Salaccio come for kind of the more conservative side, but he had a case, he's an anesthesiologist. So, so I, I would say that you do have problems with longer wait times, especially in, in Britain and uh, in Canada yeah. as well. Um, Good. I, I, Rishi was telling us one of our okay. MCS sessions sure. how long his dad had to wait for like a, it was like either a hip replacement or some kind of orthopedic surgery. But on the other hand, in those countries, you do everyone does have access to a doctor. But uh, sometimes the wait times in Canada are bad enough that people from Canada do come to the United States and pay So understand, there's a difference between uh, waiting a long time for a procedure and not being allowed to be in the line well, to begin with. That's how there's games where I heard somebody who actually died while waiting for a procedure. He had a hip replacement that got infected. He got on a line to get a procedure done and he just died. So if you have a really long wait time, it doesn't really help you to have insurance. No. So, how? So, is that so they're but the wait they're, they're not wait times for emergencies. But uh, our look, emergency departments are inundated with people uh, because, and it's not that if you look at the the cross section of people coming into the emergency department, we're getting inundated with the well-to-do with insured people. They just simply can't get into their GP's office. This illusion that we don't have a line here. It's just that it's an illusion, uh, uh, but it is. But it is true for certain procedures. You have to wait longer for hip replacement than in place A than in, than in place B. There's no question about that. But anyway, what's in the United States? 
what's it did, if you look at the economics of single pay, of Medicare, Medicaid versus commercial insurance, what are what are the differences? Can read that? So you take Medicare and Medicaid, which are government insured. Uh, versus so socialized that, medicine. No, 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 no. Versus commercial insurance. Well, first of all, you're guaranteed Medicare once you reach your retirement age. Um, it still has premiums, but they're, they're premiums that most people can pay. Um, On the physician side, they get reimbursed less from Medicare and Medicaid, right? Is that true? So um, med a lot of insurances are in the United States are based on the Medicare rate, and we negotiate with all these different companies uh, for that rate. So, uh, and it, you typically, in private insurance will be higher than the Medicare rate. The Medicaid rate varies from state to state. It may be the same as Medicare in one state. Uh, in New York State, for the first 15 years I was in emergency medicine, uh, if you came in with an insect bite or a cardiac arrest, if you were a Medicaid patient, I got paid six dollars. That was it, six dollars. And uh, but the hospitals were reimbursed well, so they sort of tried to offset the uh, physician call. So one of the big things that single payer uh, proponents will say about the commercial insurers is that if you look at what money goes to a doctor, nurse, a hospital, a drugstore, or whatever else, it's 97 cents on the dollar. There's 3% overhead for Medicare and Medicaid. For commercial insurers, it's about a 33% overhead. It goes to your shareholders, uh, overhead, and this sort of thing. And an example, a wonderful example of the end result of this, and this was from 15 years ago, so it's probably uh, worse now, is Toronto General and Mass General have about the same volume of patients. Uh, and at the time of this measure, uh, Toronto General had three coders that worked for coding and billing. And Mass General had 200 coders and billers. We spent at Stony Brook, I think, about $20 million a year on billing for, our, for the physician practice plan. And all this effort that goes into so some of the, the, there's always this debate about if we, that this is sort of found money you could use either to pay people better or you could take that money and, sh and insure everybody and you wouldn't, it wouldn't cost an additional uh, penny to do so. Uh, uh, government regulation is a thing people are really scared of, but that already exists. They're paying two thirds of the nut already. So we jump through all sorts of hoops uh, based on what bureaucrats say. You, yeah, you had a... So then the argument is that there would be less overhead to pay. I thought one of the selling points for the Affordable Care Act was that we could keep the same insurance. And I wasn't really sure where the front line is between insurance companies and the government and how that all interlaces with each other. But uh, I lost my question. So you couldn't, you basically, it was politically impossible to pass a law that left the insurance companies out. So you had so, uh, yeah, and to the extent where they even kept out a single payer option. You know, government, I don't know if you remember, there was a debate about whether or not to have a government option. So that if I'm 30 years old, I could still buy basically Medicare. And, but the problem was it would be about three or $4,000 cheaper than, than commercial insurance. That should give you a subtle clue right there as to, as to where the uh, power is lying. But uh, you could keep the insurers out politically. So, but you can you can at least create something where there was a. Uh, uh, it would be three three thousand three thousand dollars cheaper current Medicare premiums. Yeah, yeah. But Med Medicare doesn't. The premiums don't fund Medicare. Medicare is currently gone the path to bankruptcy. It's. I think it's going to be insolvent by like twenty thirty three. Well, it's, if we, it's very clear. We need to change. This is a pro this is a fundamental problem that we are faced with, and you see how we deal with reality in the United States, with uh, with healthcare costs, with uh, uh, global warming, with with with. You can count the numbers and see that it's getting too big. Just like you can look at the climate and see it's not it's going in a, in a certain direction, but we don't want to fix it today. We'll like, fix it tomorrow. We want to fix it a 
we don't know, we want to fix it. Wouldn't putting more people on the rolls be making it worse? That then it'll be insolvent in like 2024. No, we have, well, this, so let's say somebody comes forward, Bernie Sanders comes forward, I want a single payer. Yeah. So there's, there's a huge money shift. The, so all this money that goes into private insurance now gets shifted over into public funding, and it's funded by the tax base. So you make less money, you pay less for your health care. You make more money, you pay higher taxes, you pay more for your health care. So it's a different way of funding. Employers might view this as, you know what, I can now manufacture cars, and I've gotten rid of my biggest cost, which is health care costs for my employers. Uh, and it allows me to be much more competitive. Right. For the worker, it allows them to go anywhere they want. They don't have to worry about their health health insurance. So there are many ramifications of a, of a single payer. Uh, uh, you get more bang for your buck right now with a single payer. Uh, the, so why would we fear a single payer? Why is that bad for you? Well, everything well, the government does kind of sucks. I mean, <laughs> bankrupt, everybody, the VA is killing patients. Everything that the government did, the government might have done it for cheaper, but they were really, really bad. So they had the black horse. Who's the white horse? Uh, I don't know. So I think for single payer, I will add a caveat. If, if there, you, you insert that government cannot use collective bargaining to lower the reimbursement rate, it might not be so bad. The thing is, I think in countries where you have a single payer, um, you right because right now, if you have a single payer, then you in bargaining reimbursement rate with everyone else, you have that's a lot of power, and that's how countries like Taiwan, Japan, I think you can are able to force costs down um, and use the word force. Um, so, for example. My, my dad, when he talks about a time in Taiwan when physicians were making this much, right? And then single payer comes along. Everybody else is happy because now you have access and things are cheaper, except for the physicians because then now government lowered, they don't want to cut costs and then now you make this much. And there you, you know, it's a single payer system and there may, may be some private here and there, but you don't, you don't take what they give you, well, no one else is going to give you any reimbursement because it's a single payer system. So so everybody, everybody's familiar that our health care costs per capita are higher than anywhere else in the world, right? Every, is, is this in dispute or everybody in agreement with that? <clears throat> the question is why? Mostly drugs. We pay 10 times more. No, it's not just drugs. I, would, I, would, I would say a lot of it is the opacity of the pricing. So let, let me ask you guys a question. Let's say you, in case you broke your arm, you want to call a hospital and ask them how much it costs to fix a broken arm or to get a knee replacement. Is, is there any way you guys, would, do you think you could do that? Do you think you could just give them a call or go on their website and see how much that stuff costs? You'd have to give them your insurance information. Yeah, there, there, there's no way, right? Because the answer to how much it costs is how much the hospital can get away with. No, that's not the question. The question is why does the United States why are we the most expensive uh, healthcare consumer in the world? Well, the thing is, I would say a big part of the reason is that the two people making the healthcare decisions, the physician and the patient, have no idea what anything costs. They have no idea what the price of anything is, and so they don't even take it into consideration when making any sort of healthcare decision. So of course we're going to get a wildly inefficient system if the people that are making So is there decisions. evidence that our system is more inefficient than other systems? Is there evidence that our system uses more CAT scans, more MRIs, more tests, more this, more chemotherapy, more blah, 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 than other systems? No. Because the answer is the reason we are more expensive is because the doctor is more expensive, the nurse is more expensive, the hospital is more expensive, the physical therapist is more expensive, the drugs are more expensive. Every aspect of our healthcare system, we charge more. And if you're part of that system, you like that. I like that we charge a lot. You're going to like that you charge a lot. You're going to be raking in the dough. There's a few specialists that have taken a huge hit from the time uh, I got out of medical school. Uh, ophthalmologists got their uh, rates 
cut from just ridiculous uh, uh, to, to almost within our solar system. Uh, um, uh, and they were the first ones sort of taken out. Radiologists, a lot of the stuff at Cascan that used to cost three or four thousand dollars now costs a couple hundred dollars to do. So things change over time and there's the charges. And one of the problems with the charges is that they make no sense, there's no relationship whatsoever to any sane, predictable way of going about things. So that uh, uh, newer technologies are ridiculously expensive and it takes a long time for that new technology for the, for the price to come down. There isn't that sort of competition in medicine. But the real fundamental problem in the United States we don't use as much technology as some other countries, as some Scandinavian countries or Japan. Uh, so that's not the reason, that's not the excuse. It's just that everything costs more. I have a question about this thing health costs, healthcare costs. Um, how do you take into account people going from one country to the other for healthcare? I know that uh, a lot of hospitals in the US advertise I know Winthrop advertises about people who come from Scandinavia to get yeah. their cyber money. Yeah, and why well, they advertise it? They advertise that because they want us to go there to get it also. Yeah. Uh, so do you, how much of their budget do you think is to, is dedicated to Scandinavian cyber? Well, that's what, that's that's what I'm asking. What what proportion of cost of healthcare can be attributed to people? What percentage of the cost of healthcare do they represent? People who travel from Europe to the U.S. and the arguments that people in Europe are spending less on their health care and living longer. Well, there's, uh, there's also the, the reverse direction. There's a lot of people from the United States are going right, to so India how, or to uh, Costa Rica. So has, has, anybody, right. has anybody actually looked and seen how, how much of that? How much I, thought, of I would not exists? guess that that would have, that, 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 that you could just uh, probably ignore that uh, because the, the, the budget is for this is so huge. Now, Frank wanted me to make sure, be sure to make the point that if you go to a European country... Is he coming, by the way? Uh, no, he can't, because he's, he's stuck. Is that the tax rates there are much higher than they are in the United States. Um, the, uh, uh, and so there's this argument about a lot of this stuff as to what the government role should be. It's not made very intelligently in the United States, I don't think. When you listen to debates, what do you hear? You hear about taxes, and what is the question? Do you want to increase taxes or decrease taxes? And what's the answer? It doesn't matter what side you're on, you want to decrease taxes. Now, you may want to decrease them for a certain group or whatever else, but nobody wants, will ever say increase taxes. Have any of you ever heard a politician actually link tax rate to benefits? So Bernie's, Bernie's the first guy I've ever heard in my life that, that, uh, that says, and that, but the question is never asked in, in, in public, uh, is would you, would it be worth it to you to have a higher tax rate if medical school was free? Yeah. Uh, it's all uh, and not going to medical school, probably not. The question is what the tax rate is. It's, it's like 99% of people don't have So do people medical think school. that people think you should pay for high school? Should, 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 high, should high school be free, or should, should you pay tuition to go to high school? You do pay. Right, it's it's paid by you do local pay. taxes. No, it's paid by taxes. But taxes means that if you don't make much, you don't pay any taxes. If you make a lot, you pay more taxes. So if it's a, it's a tax-based decision. Yeah. But if you decided, I'm not going to fund high schools anymore, your taxes would be a lot lower. Uh, compare the taxes on the North Shore to taxes in uh, uh, West Hampton or East Hampton. For the same house, you pay uh, $25,000 in taxes in Stony Brook, and you would pay $5,000 in taxes in East Hampton. Why? Because the school district is a wintertime district, but they have a tax base that's a, it's a summertime base. So you have a huge population that pays for a small school district. So there's a, there's a huge difference in South Shore and North Shore. Uh, once you get out to the Hamptons, in terms of what, what your what your uh, tax base is, but that could be the debate now: is why why are we having public funding for high schools? Why don't we just make everybody pay tuition? I mean, to me, a lot of the times it comes back to think of it like a Beckett, right? 
Like you can say that this signed Mickey Mantle card is worth a million dollars, but it's worth exactly as much as someone pays for it. Yeah. And in the system that we've had, where no one has said, this is the limit, we get this situation where if you want, to if you want the best medical care in the world for your you know, super, rare or super, com super rare condition or your super complex procedure, you come to the US, right? But we've allowed that, we've allowed the system to favor the top end. So when people make the argument, there's two sides of this for me. When people make the argument that a free market is the answer, my argument, to, my counter argument to that is that that's what we've had, right? We've had opaque pricing in the same way that, like, I don't know a lot about how, what banks and stuff pay, and banks make a ton of money. There's, there's no accountability in the system, right? There's no, you know, this baseball card is worth $200 and this x-ray is worth $200 because an x-ray is worth $200, right? If we allow that system to be, things are gonna be worth exactly as much as someone can pay for them, then people are always gonna ask for more as long as there are people there who can pay more. So you see things float to the top and you see the specialties go absolutely nuts and through the roof, right? Because people know that there's money to be made there. I think that until we have a cultural shift where we say our priority is to care for everybody, which I think, I, I don't think that everything about the Affordable Care Act is gospel, I really don't. But I think that fundamentally from a values perspective, it stops the bleeding. It at least helps to stop the bleeding. And when people say, I think the government, when they take control of stuff, does mess a lot of stuff up, but they also do a lot of stuff right. And they save a lot of lives that way. I mean, we like to think about the things that don't work, but people, people's lives are saved every day by seatbelts. We pay taxes to pave the roads. I went to a public high school that was funded by people's tax money. We don't mess everything up. And if we don't have a system where there are a universal set of standards of what is just plain okay, what is acceptable, it's not okay to pay $3,000 for a CAT scan someplace and $1,500 someplace else. It, the system's never gonna level out, right? I don't know, that's kind of like a lot of different things in one place, but. <laughs> I have, I have a question for you guys. Why, why is it that a loaf of bread isn't two thousand dollars? Well, 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 like our our bread company is <coughs> any less greedy than uh, radiologists. Why, why why can't they charge two thousand dollars for a loaf? Because no one's going to pay it. But right. if, say, no, but no, if you want, well, well, just because it's really easy to make a loaf of well, bread. Well, well, right, exactly. Yeah. There's there's no way they can get away with it. It's open. It's transparent. Right. You can see. Right. A competing if you company. charge two thousand for it, I'll charge a dollar for it. Right. Exactly. And they'll come to me. But and this whole thing about free market and healthcare, to what does the free market apply? Does it apply to you when you're having a heart attack? You you are the patient. Do you know your diagnosis? Do you know what you're going to need? Do you know what the place has to offer? So th there's a lot of this free market stuff is gobbledygook for, to me, for, oh, look that way. And then, and then I pull your wallet out of your pocket and I, I pocket your money. Uh, it, it's not a, it's a free market for a group of people. It's a free market for the doctors, the insurers. Well, it's not a free market for everybody when the government's spending 64 cents out of every healthcare dollar. But um, I, I, I don't think that anyone who's seriously making a free market argument go, just goes ahead and says, oh, just make it from free market. So, so by the way, how did the free market work? I think that's kind of like a very big yeah. mischaracterization of the argument that's so like did, analogous I, to like the death panels. Like the how did the free market work before Medicare and Medicaid? Um, you mean In other words, what did, the gov what did the government do to us as a profession when Medicare and Medicaid came into being? As a first year medical student. So, as, the, as the son of a GP, I can tell you, my father, this was before Medicare and Medicaid, you came to his office, he gave you a bill, you paid out of pocket. He had to look you in the face, you looked him back in the face. So an office visit was five bucks. It wasn't 300 bucks, it was five bucks. And, and, and sometimes, and if you couldn't pay it, you could get brought a watermelon or a chicken instead. And, and a lot of uh, we had a lot of people showing up to our house with with uh, a baked turkey or, or whatever else to pay for their pay for their health care that they otherwise uh, couldn't pay for. That was the free market, and you everybody knew everybody in town who charged whatever else. 
the AMA went ballistic over Medicare and Medicaid. It was like government interference, absolutely. No, 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 no. That created the golden age of medicine. Physicians, because when that came into being, physicians were paid what they billed. And I didn't have to look you in the eye anymore. I sent the bill to them. And guess what? What do you think happened to the bills? And what do you think happened to physician income and hospital income? This was the biggest boom for medicine in the history of medicine. And now we want to shed tears because we want to pull back a little bit. But please understand that this, this set people from making, you know, a doctors making thirty or forty thousand dollars a year, which was a good salary in, in 1960 maybe, to make it in three or four or five hundred thousand dollars it, it just it just the change of a couple of years. The message I take that is that the government's just really bad at setting prices for medicine, so why would we well, don't have try to the prices? Well, but, but again, you know, sure they do. I mean, Medicare decides what it is. There is a they they can negotiate. negotiate. You have to take this in context. At that time, the economy was great. Uh, you didn't have, uh, there was, as far as I can recall, there was one treatable cancer at that time, which was Hodgkin's disease. That was it. Nothing else. Uh, so you didn't have expensive chemotherapy. Uh, heart failure, MIs, they were treated at home because the hospital didn't offer you anything. There was no cast, anything else. So it, it was mostly just cognitive services and simple things like gallbladders or appendix or C-sections and, and, and this sort of thing. So it was easy to fund. And Medicare for people over 65, when the average life expectancy was 67, you're not expecting this to be a huge explosion. So things you know, rapidly changed after that. It, uh, uh, but every time a new technology came out, there was no breaks on uh, uh, what you would charge. And uh, until it became, got to the point where it was absurd, and now there's this huge bureaucracy that tries to deal with with that sort of stuff. So it's, it's with all laws, there are unintended consequences and intended consequences. And sometimes they benefit the patient, they benefit you, or they don't benefit anybody. They benefit a uh, bureaucrat. So it's tricky, tricky business. But I wish there was. There's a big, you know what? This big push for transparency is going to be very embarrassing for us. Very, very embarrassing. Uh, there was an article that looked at. Uh, went through the, the national database on, on charge for appendicitis, for appendectomy. And the lowest was something like $1,200 at UCSF, $182,000 for, for a person who got an appendectomy. Whoa! I guess they sort of massaged the thing out. I don't know what, what they're doing. They just sucked it out through a little straw. I don't know what they did with uh, 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 that's why there's this big push for transparency now. Uh, but those charges are completely artificial. Because when if you have insurance, you come into my institution, the insurance is going to pay a certain amount. Uh, and we're not going to charge you another $180,000. We generally will take the insurance. But, but if you come in with no insurance, you get that charge ticket. You know, $275,000, $270 for that piece of toilet paper you had to use, and, and uh, the aspirin, that was a little $400 for, because this big aspirin, not a small aspirin. So it's, it's goofy how we do this stuff. Uh, do you guys think that uh, routine medical expenses should be completely paid for by insurance, or do you, do you think that the patient should have responsibility for that? That's kind of a complex question. Um, I was going to, I'll get back to it. I feel like Dr. Dr. This one? Vichella. Yeah. Vichella. Vichella. Peter. Were you, were you leading the question towards like free, the free rider problem earlier? You were asking about taxes and whatnot. You're, you're asking why they should, people should pay for high school? No, I mean, we have this stuff about big government versus small government. We have the government does a bad job, which more often than not means that you're pissed off that they didn't go with, do as good as you expected them to do. Like, we're pissed off at the EPA for what they didn't do with the water in Flint, Michigan. Even though there was a whole collusion of politicians there and whatnot, the EPA did not do their thing. So our conclusion, although we say government sucks, I think deep down inside we're going, 
I really did. I was really expect. I expect my food to be safe. I expect my water to be safe. Why? Wishful thinking? No, it's a thing called. These are the things that we expect our government to do. So, and, and if you pose the question that way, rather than do you want big government or small government, just start step by step. Do you want military? I don't know. It's 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 a yes or no question. But but if you want military, do you want it government funded or private funded? You want roads, you want to be able to drive home from here. And if you want to drive home from here, do you want it to be, you want to pay a toll every time you go? I mean, that's one way of doing it. We can have private companies that, that build roads. Uh, places that live in low density neighborhoods are not going to have roads, because there's, or else they're going to have to pay ridiculous tolls. So these are, these are choices we make. Do you want roads or not? Do you want police or not? Do you want electricity and what? Do you want water or not? Uh, uh, do you want to go into a grocery store and know that you're not going to buy s some salmonella ridden thing uh, and that you can go home and eat it safely? So you can keep asking those well, questions. Do you think in, in the absence of government regulation, every single thing you bought at the supermarket would be salmonella ridden? Or, or there'd be no roads if the government didn't build them? I mean, that, that's ridiculous, right? They, 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 we just like be riding horses through mud trailways. That's not realistic. Um, I, I want to ask you guys, I want to tell you, compare uh, countries where the government runs everything uh, to more free market countries like America and compare the environment. Like, and what do you guys think is the difference in the water quality in countries like China uh, and the former Soviet Union between countries like, uh, let's say, America and Canada, which are more free market? Well, it depends where you live, right? Well, oh, oh, on, the, on the whole, the, the, the water quality, the air quality, the environment is and, much and, better and in, in, right? country, in countries with a, with a freer market because if the government ran everything, you just wouldn't have the wealth. But you have to understand, you've got to distinguish, what, about the clean? Yeah, got to distinguish yeah. what results are there because of free market yeah. as opposed to effective versus ineffective. Right. So if, you, if you want to compare the Clean Air and the Clean Water Act, when those came out, the same argument was government inter interference, right? but before that, you know, when, when our country went through our industrial period, we didn't have that period. And then you have steps, and then you, have, you build consumer Sure, companies. but I think we should ask it's what's mix, the government you know, capable of doing. Right? Is, is a government agency capable of creating the iPhone? Is a government agency capable of creating the CAT scan machine? Where, but, where but have these If you look at the technology from? inside the iPhone, one might ask, where, what's the provenance of that technology? A lot of things came from military. That's taxpayer funded, right? So I think it's I think we see a lot of these mixed models in healthcare. So if you're going to argue free market for that stuff, don't jump into a deep dark hole. Because when you look at most pharmaceutical discoveries, they were not discovered by the pharmaceutical company. They were developed in Stony Brook or they were developed at uh, MIT or somewhere. The internet. And then they are and then they are. Uh, trotted out to, for, to a pharmaceutical company for trials. You think the iPhone, everything in this iPhone was it was invented by Apple? Uh, or, or do you think it's military research? My buddies at MIT, whatever else that, uh, uh, you know, there's uh, the guy that developed the transistor. A lot of stuff that we enjoy in our life comes from basic research that we've, that we funded. No, it's absolutely it's true. That's that. how the polio vaccine came about. It, it would be ridiculous to say the government doesn't do anything good, but what I would say is generally it does a less efficient job at things. So if you had the government trying to, like, let's say, make bread, or if you had like uh, the Department of the Interior try to manufacture cars, they'll probably do a much lousier job and a much more expensive job than if. Ford or Toyota or someone else. But if, but if the people in a democracy don't like that job, the people then have the faculty to reelect new people who can maybe do a better job. If you if the system is privatized, the people lose the say. If well, we with, the, with the car company, the if, 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 if you don't like the cars that GM makes, you don't have to buy them. And if in, enough people do that, GM goes out of business unless the government bails them out. But um, it's, 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 I think that's a more effective way of vote, a uh, way of the consumer getting to choose and voting, because at the end of the day, you get to vote in the primary, and then you get to vote for Republican or Democrat. You don't get to vote on each specific policy. You could be, you know, pro-choice, but more fiscally conservative, and the political system doesn't allow for those options. 
when you're just buying things, like let's say when you're buying a phone, you're effectively voting for that company when you choose to buy that phone. Well, there, I mean, this is, uh, to some degree, you tilt at windmills. You can, you can, it's, it, it's uh, it, if you allow the government to do anything correctly, then that means you want the government to do everything correctly. And I, I think that's just a silly argument that I want the government to take over the manufacturer of bread and cars. Not sure, but what, uh, what, what uh, do you want it to do? What, I think that that's a question that you need, you ask to the public. One of the problems I feel in our country is the inability to have intelligent discourse on, on uh, issues. Uh, yeah. Even on what I consider one of the, the more neutral of the cable companies, CNN, when I watch their political, Ten years ago, if you watched their political analysis, they'd have a conservative, they'd have a liberal, you know, they'd sort of argue with each other, and it was sort of punditry bullshit. Right. <laughs> but what do they have now? They have a person who's for Trump. They have a person who's for Cruz. They have a person who's for Clinton. They have a person who's for Sanders, and they just, they just spit out what their candidate's saying. There's not really a discussion. If you say the earth is flat and I say it's round, They'll talk about you know how the crowd responded to me versus how they responded to you. There's no analysis of whether the world's actually round or flat. I mean, it's just bizarre. So, so I think that, that our our biggest danger in terms of political discourse and what the government does is whether we just undermine this thing uh, with, until it becomes just a little childish game, uh, which has no meaning. But yeah, yeah, I man. I think what we've seen in the past is that really. I mean, you could argue for either one of these extremes, either complete free market control or complete government control. We've seen examples in the past where kind of moving to one of those extremes hasn't really worked. Uh, because either, I mean, if you talk about you know, total government control, I mean, there are examples in the USSR, and then if you talk about like free market control, I mean, there are, you may talk about efficiency, but then there are other costs, like environmental costs and other damage that it causes as well. I mean, Really what I think is that like the answer would lie somewhere in the middle of those two, right? We'd have to come up with a balance between the two. I mean in terms of like regulating and like like the, it, it, it can't go completely one way or completely the other. There needs to be some kind of balance between the two. Yeah, I, I, I do agree with that and I'm not against the all government activities. I'm I'm in favor of the social safety net. Um, I'm in I'm in favor of Medicaid, of poor people being able to access health care. Um, I think the EPA was necessary since uh, with pollution that's a problem where the company is polluting and uh, it, 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 no one, if they don't have to pay for it, they're just going to keep doing it, so it's a negative externality, so the government does have to step in there. But I, what I would just caution is that the government has limitations when it attempts to do certain things, so I would think that, I would just say that there's a difference between the intent of a law and the effect of a law. And it's it's very important to look at that. So that is just one particular thing about, about health care law. Health care law comes from health care law. It also comes from ta tax law. There's a thing called entitlement, which is from the from the tax, uh, uh, from TEFRA. I forget what TEFRA stands for, but it's something, Re Tax Reconciliation Act. And within that, they, they uh, wrote the Antala Law, which requires us to see people and stabilize them regardless of their ability to pay. So that's an example of health care law that comes from tax law. A lot of health care law are not specific. Here is a laundry list of 70,000 things you need to do. But what it is instead is we're going to create a health department. And we're going to give that this, in New York State. The New York State health law creates a health department and gives them the administrative authority to effectively create health law. So it wasn't the, le the legislature can create specific health law, but they can create a health entity which then can roll out administrative law. And that varies hugely from state to state, uh, and uh, uh, it, it varies a great deal. Now it's interesting with the Medicaid, uh, if you were a state that, that uh, accepted government this is bizarre. If you accepted government Medicaid, you got a lot of money to insure a lot more people in your state. And yet a number of states refuse to do it. And why, what would be the argument for that? Why, why they refuse to do it? I think mean, probably, probably for partisan reasons. <coughs> you, 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 you could ask that. But why for, part, for partisan reasons? I mean, they accept funding for military bases in their state. That's okay. Well, they probably just didn't want to be seen as being pro-Obama. 
I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not coming at this from like a Republican angle, by the way. I couldn't care less what about the relevant uh, political parties. What was the deal with you that they would, it was the federal government said it would match yeah. for the first however many years and they'll cut back? Yeah. So then if I'm a state and I don't have the ability to take care of all these patients when you withdraw your support, why would I say yes in the first place? Because you can have it now. But then like every election, you know, all of a sudden, so I think it was, I, I think that was one of the reasons. Um, I was wondering if you can speak a little bit about, at least in terms of like health insurance, um, why, like in terms of like Death Spiral, um, these like classic insurance problems, why a middle of the road, so to speak, you have some regulation, and then a lot of like freedom then to choose between these things might be the better solution. Well, you start with that as, uh, start with Medicare. Here's Medicare, it's this big. It's gonna fund people over 65 years old. But then you discover some doctors are falsely billing Medicare. Oops, now we better create a bureaucracy around that to start looking at the billing, make sure it's fair. And then you gotta create a bureaucracy around the bureaucracy to make sure that that bureaucracy is doing its a job and this is a problem this is a typical problem is we start with trying to do this and then we have to build these circles around it to make sure that uh, uh, everybody is fair and you know what it may maybe somebody should have asked the question should we just let some of that fraud happen and save 500 billion dollars instead of spending that 500 billion dollars to capture 10 billion dollars but to keep the keep the system honest but uh, uh, your thing about uh, about people about uh, I'm sorry I was, I, was, I was referring to because I remember when I took a little bit of healthy thought they were talking about if it's just in, in, in a private in, in insurance um, it's very popular to say oh for example um, they don't want they, they have these somewhat discriminatory practices against people who want health insurance right and if you think about it so I'm running a health insurance, and the way I, the insurance flow stays afloat is if not everyone is using it at the same time, right? But then who's incentivized to buy health insurance? The people who really need to even pay for their services. So, right? so it's asked in a different way, why why was part of the uh, um, Accountable Health Care Act a, mandate. Uh, a mandate on individuals? Right. Uh, what do insurance companies try to do before the law? You guys are all healthy, so I'll insure you. You have a pre-existing condition, forget it. I don't want to pay for you. you. You got some chronic illness, forget it. I'm not going to include you. Why? Because I can collect everybody's premiums, and I'm going to have to. And the likelihood is I'll have to spend very little money. So I make a huge profit. I can even charge you fairly reasonable rates because none of you are going to get sick. Uh, and if you do, I'll figure out how to drop you after a year, uh, so I can keep my rates down. So. Uh, that's why people with pre-existing conditions and whatnot couldn't get insurance unless they paid a ridiculous amount of money. This was the free market at work the way the free market is supposed to work. That's the purpose of the free market is if I'm a, if I'm a company, what's my purpose? Profit. Okay. If I make bread, what's my purpose? Profit. If I make cars, what's my purpose? Profit. And if I provide health insurance, what's my purpose? Profit. So I do things, I set my rates so I can make a profit. And I set my rates by who I insure as well as what those rates are. That's the free market at work. Then you have this nasty government regulation that comes in and says, that's not fair to a, real, to a big population of patients. In fact, it's sort of not fair to those people that actually need the insurance. All of you that don't need insurance here have it, but but uh, we're excluding the very people that do need insurance. That they have diabetes, or they have severe hypertension, or they have kidney disease, or whatever else we can. Until they are impoverished, so they qualify for Medicaid, or until they're on dialysis, so that they qualify for Medicare, as well. Uh, they're just out of luck. I think that argument is quite disingenuous because the job of a free market company is to put out a good product and to attract customers. The problem with insurance is that nobody actually knows what the product is. 
go to an insurance agent or something and they sign a bunch of papers, they don't really know what they're getting themselves into. That's it. right. Which goes back to the problem that we need more transparency, not necessarily. Or well, who's going to enforce the transparency? Why do you think you don't know what you're buying when you buy insurance? Because well, of the free market. Who I want to have as much of an advantage well, well, hold as possible. I, 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 I want a chance to rebut this. So, um, are you trying to say that before the ACA we had a total free market in healthcare? Because that's, that's not true. What, no, no, no. Is, is, you is, had, there, you is, there something, is there something unique about healthcare that for some reason the free market works brilliantly for everything? It works for our phones, it works for, it, it works for making this desk, for making these tiles, but so, well, why didn't they charge us $100,000 for tiles? Isn't there, How well does the free market for, work for this? Very well. Everybody has one. Yeah, everybody has one. What's the rate on Verizon versus AT&T? Isn't it mysterious that it's the same? It's, uh, it's, it's a magical thing. It's, uh, uh, see, I, I think... Is it the same? I measure PCS and mine is lower. Oh, that's because, because of the free market. No, 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 that's true. That's, that's probably an example of a good free market. Right. But the problem with... with uh, uh, it's like the problem with insider trading. It's... Uh, What's the, what should the purpose of the SEC be? It should be that all of us can sit at the table equally and have equal access to information in order to make decisions about stocks. And you have an advantage over me because you spend more time learning it or whatever, but you don't have an advantage because you have insider information and this sort of thing. That's called free market leveling of the, of the of playing board and this sort of thing. But with insurance, it's, uh, uh, I, don't know, I don't know how to understand my insurance. It's, it's ridiculous. Uh, when you are in, when you work as faculty here, you are a member of UUP, the, it's the uh, University of Faculty Union, and so that union has expertise experts that look at the insurance, and push for certain benefits. We get eyeglasses and that sort of thing. Uh, uh, but it's it's uh, it's a very tricky business with the uh, free market. Everybody know the, the, the Part D, uh, Medicare Part D? Yeah. And what was one of the rules for that when it was passed? Okay, you can't re-import drugs from Canada. No, 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 no. Can't can't drug 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 the fundamental thing, the government can't negotiate drug prices. cannot negotiate <laughs> drug prices. Otherwise That's part of the law. Now, why would that be part of the law? You don't want to lose profit. Think of the too much pressure. Well, if he were, the government can't negotiate drug so, prices. So, so is, that, is that the free market? If I remember, right, it, was, it has to do with, it was like, it was a political compromise, I think. Yeah. Something like that. Just, you know. It was a, it was a lobbyist car, that. So, so the government had its decisions influenced by a corrupt mechanism. So, that's not a free market at all. That's what free markets are there to prevent. If the private insurance companies can, can negotiate with the drug company, with the drug companies, the prices would go down. And who is it banning the reimportation of cheaper drugs from Canada? It's the government. There's no insurance company with a profit motive standing at the Canadian border banning us from importing cheaper drugs. It's the government banning the importation of cheaper drugs to benefit the people who contributed to the politicians that passed the law. So the free market was completely absent there. I think in a lot of discussions. Well, that was. I, I'm not. Sh I, actually, I don't. I think in a lot. Of I know what I read a lot of, and I don't know if that's what drove it, honestly. But uh, uh, one of the issues that kept coming up over and over again in the journal was the number of imported drugs that were actually fake. Uh, uh, and they were not actually what they said they would be. That what was printed on the capsule, they were just fake drugs. Was that an issue from Canada, or was that an issue from Uganda? Yeah, no, no. uh, it, was, it was imported from wherever you go on the website, and they may say they're from Canada or from India or wherever else, and you order it, and it's delivered to your house. And uh, so there were some issues with that. I think it's loosened up a little bit with, uh, uh, with Canada. But it's, it's still a problem because they do have cheaper prices for drugs. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I and mean, you're not allowed to buy drugs in Canada, so we have to pay uh, oh, yeah. high Canadians prices. Canadians are really, there's like a, 
funny, they have these funny reports of Americans crossing the border to try to buy cheap drugs, and then the Canadians are kind of wary of that. That's another story. I was going to comment, I think, in a lot of discussions I've said in about this, um, sometimes terms become this black hole term. Um, I think the government is this huge entity comprised of various agents, and a lot of different actors and interests, and then in different, in different branches. And I think, you know, and again, like, that's one thing, and when we talk about the free market, or the market in general, that's also a very complex structure. Um, I think the, a lot of the more interesting conversation comes out when the term gets parsed out a little more. Um, it's not, just be, like who, who within your elected representatives are pushing for or against these like, drug laws or within in, in the, the agencies as part of the executive branch appointed by whom wanted to do what. It gets kind of complicated, you know, but this is a common. I, I see people are, are starting to, to trickle out, so um, I just wanted to ask you guys if there are any other questions or points that you'd like to make, or if there's anything, any other issues um, relating to healthcare policy you'd like to see discussed in the future. I'm curious a more about numbers. A lot of everybody kind of agrees that yeah, there's a need for regulation, and the regulation could be stifling. Uh, I'm curious to know if anybody's actually uh, has any real evidence. Just comparison of the U.S. and European models that one is better than the other. What are the advantages of one? Uh, advantages of, like, for instance, one or one? Uh, single-payer healthcare over uh, what the U.S. has. The documentary was made for the, um, the thing, the, the healthcare economics system. one was pretty good. Yeah, they went into a lot of numbers. Yeah. Their number, uh, a lot of the numbers that they, that they gave, especially those that like, were passed around, gave were kind of useless. Uh, I'll, I'll look something up, but I imagine like those would exist, um, mm -hmm. probably by, done by advocates on both sides. So maybe do like a more conservative leaning think tank and a more liberal leaning think tank. And get a lot of health economic papers have looked at it, and there's some actually I think pretty surprising results. A lot of the times they're like. Like you have these popular notions that these like socialized medicine in Scandinavian countries, oh my god, it's heaven. And then you like compare some stuff and you know, there's a No, exactly. So those are the type of things that I would like to know. Some people say it's heaven, some people say that it's terrible, so where did this lie in? Well I think an yeah. interesting interesting way to look at this is if you talk about uh, the societal functions that are provided to the people across the board, which I think translates into government provision. So military, uh, uh, every country funds this through their tax base. Roads, uh, every country funds this through a tax base. Some countries have private people roads. No, then, no, of course you'll have private roads, and you'll have turnpikes and whatnot that have tolls. But as you go into villages and whatnot, the roads are, are, are provided by government, either state or local or Whatever police is generally uh, uh, government based. I'm not, I'm not talking federal government. It may be local government. You know, we have Suffolk County police. We have police for head of the harbor and whatever else. Uh, we fund uh, elementary school and uh, high school uh, through through really tax based government. So gov government the government collects the money and redistributes it to the schools. Now we start to look at some other countries where they have health care. Uh, um, it all all healthcare is covered by government. Uh, for us, it's some. Uh, some where college is uh, at least public schools are free. Uh, you may have vacation in some uh, in some of these countries that are mandatory. It's mandatory that you take vacation every year. You have to, uh, and a bunch of other things that you can just keep listing that are or are not provided by countries. And in other countries, each of these questions is associated with, is it worth your tax rate in order to have these benefits? We can get rid of these benefits, and we can lower your tax rate. So if, if you think of it this way, in terms of linking the amount of tax you pay and the rate you have to the services the government you provide, that provide, 
the, few, the less the government provides, the more take-home pay you pay. And the, well, the more they provide, the less the take-home pay you pay. So that's, a, that's, that's, a, the entire that's a simple question. But what's the inter interesting to me, as someone who likes a lot of take-home pay, uh, how come, for instance, with health care, probably about 40 or 50 percent of the population in the United States wants single payer? And close to 100 percent of people that have Medicare want Medicare. But if you ask these ask countries like Canada, uh, France, Germany, would they like our model? Almost nobody says yes. They think our model is crazy. So I always think that's an interesting way of uh, why is that why is that difference there? All right. But then I would also look at the immigration patterns and see if more people immigrate from America to those countries or from those countries to America. It's one thing to ask someone a question on a poll to see how they vote with their feet, I think, provides the real answer of which system they prefer. I guess. I don't think the question is, do you want the government, right? do you want taxes, or do you want the benefits? Because even when it comes to school, there are a lot of people who would rather pay for them. There are a lot of people who would advocate getting um, vouchers in order to pay for private schools. They they want to pay for school, but they want to do it on their own. And that's the same is true for healthcare. They're willing to pay for health they just want to make sure that they're paying for the product. And that's what I'm really curious to know about. Is a government, is a single payer health care the death knell for good health care? Yeah, I would say the answer is certainly not obvious. And if it were, we probably would have fixed it by now. So that's but, right. but if someone in support of the single payer would say we have proof that our system doesn't well, work. That's because we're ranked very, amongst Western countries in terms of health measurements, we're ranked very much near the bottom. What are those? But, but you have to you have to ask the question: How much of that low ranking, for instance, maternal mortality, is because of the obstetrician, and how much of it is because of of, uh, of, of wide variations in economic out, uh, uh, economic uh, distribution? Uh, if we have a free market now, it's interesting that our free market has gone. I think the top 0.1% have as much income as the bottom 50% of the United States. Uh, and there is an association between, uh, as you know, poverty and uh, uh, life expectancy and all this sort of stuff. So to attribute that to single payer versus private insurance, I think is a mistake. I, I think our problem, you know, if you compare us to Denmark, uh, Denmark doesn't have huge ghettos and, and, a, and a few very rich. It, there's a much smaller distribution from the top to the bottom. Right, but they're also all Danish. If you just like compare Danish Americans to Danish people in Denmark, that might be like a useful yeah. comparison. But if you're comparing like five million people in Denmark, which is less than the population of New York yeah. City, it's like the, uh, basically like an empire that goes from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean. Yeah. Like, yeah, you're gonna find their difference. No, so there's, there's huge differences. Yeah, and uh, 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 and it's an interesting analogy that that, that, uh, that most of the people in Denmark are Danes, because I think that I think race issues drive a lot of stuff in the United States. Small government. Well, where is the government too big? It's too big with welfare. It's too big with Medicaid. It's too big with those with those poor people. Uh, and, and that's where we don't, we need government to take care of, of the well-to-do, not the not the, the poor-to-do. And there's a lot of not not so subliminal stuff. Uh, which way does the South go, Democrat or Republican? Republican. Almost 100 percent Republican. Which way did they go in 1960 or 1963? Democrat. They're 100 percent Democrat. And then there was a civil rights act passed, and then it, it became over. Johnson, when he signed the bill, said, "Well, we've lost the South forever," uh, which, which they, they pretty much did. That was also the time of that's where the whole discussion about oh, small government became. You know, when Nixon and Kennedy debated each other, you should go and listen to their debates. It, there's hardly a discernible difference between them, but they weren't talking about small government. Well, yeah, because not, neither of them were. But if, if you look at Robert Taft, and, uh, who was Senate Majority Leader when Truman was president, if you look at the Republican Party during the Great Depression when FDR was president, yeah. 
they were small government, and that wasn't animated by racism. And for sure, I agree with you that probably uh, some of the people that are in favor of uh, small government, for them that's sort of like a dog whistle for yeah. racism, yeah. but I certainly wouldn't cast that on the majority of people who believe in those yeah. ideas. No, I um, coming back to, I guess, healthcare, I was, one of the questions I was wondering about was, how much of, like, how much of everything is just labels, and how much of it is, like, if, uh, let's say, single payer, affordable care, free market, whatever, what have you, when you put the numbers together, are they approaching about the same numeric? Solution? Before we get into like a or new big topic, I, I do want to offer people the chance to leave because th this has gone on for a yeah, over an hour, and, and I, I don't want it to be awkward for you guys. You guys have to walk through the room. So, well, the big fear for single payer payer is is easy. Again, this is single payer. They're acting as the insurer. They're not acting as the. They're not owning you. But the fear is that now they can, in one fell swoop, change your reimbursement. They could, they could even possibly make it rational. Uh, but it, it's not, I don't think physicians expect if we move to a single pair to get a big raise next year. Uh, and and that's, uh, that's the battle you will fight all your life, is that a lot of people uh, are benefiting from the system as it is. And if you change the system, you change the equation for someone. Now, if the system proposed tomorrow is, we're going to double the wages of everyone, then okay, you'd be happy with that. Uh, but that's, that, that's not going to happen. But it's not going to, either with or without single payer, it's, it's, uh, it's not going to happen. But we do spend a huge, billions and billions and billions of dollars on the, on the private insurance bureaucracy and the games that get played uh, uh, doing that. It's a little bit more straightforward with the government. But the care I provide to private insurers, all the, the, all the government regulations apply to them. It doesn't matter what their insurance is. There are certain things I have to do with them, do for them. Uh, the EMTALA law is, it applies to everyone, not just those that have uh, government-based insurance. So the regulatory stuff's already there. And I don't know that going to single payer would make that big a difference. It'll make a big difference in terms of the total costs of, of health if, if, assuming the following, assuming that nothing changed. But tomorrow we just stepped over to single payer, but we didn't change your fees. We didn't change uh, the number of CAT scans that are done, the number of people that are hospitalized or whatever else. You'd have an extra maybe 50 or $60 million to play with, if you wanted to play with it. We could give it just to you personally. To, to, to so you now suddenly in support of single payer. Uh, no, I, I was kind of thinking of like when you when under the ACA they mandated people to all participate in, in in the insurance market one way or another, the other way was being fined like taxes. Is it like is it like conceptually approaching near universal coverage? Well, it's about a 30, more, 30 million more out of 50, before 55 million were not insured, now 25 million are not insured. So it's been good for about 30 million people. I think in part of the law that uh, for the private insurers, uh, 80 cents out of every dollar has to be spent on health care. Uh, they have a cap on what the, the insurance companies used to call for, what is it, dead weight loss, on how much they couldn't keep in the, the law, like the law mandated how much they needed to actually spend on you. But then they also, for insurance, they also like set up a system where like if you get, if you, if you got unlucky and all these really sick people got to, and there's like a, like a commute, like a, almost like insurance. Yeah, you get a bail, you get a bail out. Yeah. So the insurance companies protected to some degree. I think well. insurance companies are the biggest winner for the big series. That's what people say. You don't have to buy a new product. Yeah. Well, a couple of companies just went paper, huh? Oh, co co companies come and go. All in private insurance, they've come and gone for years and years and years. So that's uh, that's nothing. That's nothing. <coughs> well, I think that's a that's a good note to end on. Uh, I'd like to thank all you guys for coming. Uh, I know it's a, it's a busy week, and uh, this new block seems pretty challenging.
but I'd like to thank you guys for still uh, taking a little time out of your time you can study to talk about. What are you um, studying? Cardio. Oh, we should have talked about that. <laughs> <laughs> what are you studying in cardiology right now? Everything. We should have talked about everything. <laughs> EKG. <laughs> EKG. <laughs> EKG. <laughs> I was in Starbucks today. He was there, and I just wanted to kind of like do EKGs because we did EKGs.